Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. It's uh, quite a pleasure to be here. It's the first time I'm in this conference, so I'm very happy that I finally managed to get here. Uh, thank you so much for the organizers for putting together such a nice event. So, docs or it didn't happen. Uh, why are we here? It's really nice to see a room uh, not empty in a documentation talk in a developer conference. This always makes me happy. Um, we are here because we want to get more users and contributors to our open source projects, hopefully. And uh, we believe, or we want to believe, that documentation is a factor and it can help. Um, and, but something, something might be stopping us from doing it, you know, and we'll kind of see what the different factors are. Um, so I do have a couple of housekeeping uh, things to say. I, first of all, I'm not taking on stage questions. So I'm sorry if you had a comment disguised as a question, you'll have to tell me in person afterwards. So I will run the full 30 minutes. And we do this in Write the Docs conferences that I organize and I find that it's much more uh, productive and it encourages more conversation. So I will be here uh, for the whole conference and on Sunday I'm gonna run a documentation clinic help desk, uh, so please come and talk to me, or you can tweet, I'm that docs lady everywhere. Um, and uh, yeah, let's just get this started. So um, like my lo lovely stage manager said, my name is Mikey, and I'm from Israel, but I live in Prague. I work at Red Hat. I am a technical writer for OpenStack platform. Um, in my uh, recent past, uh, I was documenting also OpenShift, cloud container infrastructure, and JBoss. Uh, I am a recovering Scrum master, but I still love Agile um, in whatever way it takes. <laughs> um, I also am a member of the core team uh, for Write the Docs. Write the Docs is a community for everybody who cares about documentation. It was started by the people at Read the Docs, so if anybody was going, wait, isn't that kind of similar to? Yes. So this is the people who founded Write the Docs are also the people who are running Read the Docs. Um, I used to run Django Girls workshops. I'm still quite an ally and a friend, although I'm not actively involved anymore. Uh, I'm a member of the Django Software Foundation uh, and I help them out with documentation as much as I can. And I come to events like this and I give documentation talks, mainly for Python and Django. Uh, and I also run workshops and documentation sprints and I help developers kind of diffuse some of the anxiety that people might have around documentation. Um, so, what's on the menu? Uh, there are three things that I would like to cover today. The first one is content strategy, and it might sound like a bit of a scary term, but I will explain what it is in a minute, because the main thing is, if you plan a little bit in advance, you can save a lot of time, headache, you know, aggravation, and you, know, you don't wanna do some extra work. The second one is DevOps for docs, and the main thing is that there's no reason not to integrate documentation into your development workflow. Um, and the last thing is the community spirit. This is a community conference. I am very much, I drank the, the open source Kool-Aid. I am in love with open source communities. I think it's a wonderful place um, and we can all do this together. So, uh, I would like to invite you to join the Documentarian Club. What is the Documentarian Club? What is a documentarian? Documentarian is someone who cares about documentation and communication in the software industry regardless of job title. Okay, so in the past it used to be, you know, developers, writers, designers, everybody just kind of had their own little spot. But now we're all working together, especially in smaller projects, especially in like if you, even if you work in a big company, I work at Red Hat, we have 10,000 people, you know, we still have product teams and then inside we have different components and we all work together. So everybody can care about content and about documentation, regardless of their role. And now I will do this properly because I wanted to take a drink of water and I can't do that with my clicker in my hand. Okay. So what does this content strategy mean? It's actually originally a marketing uh, term from you know web marketing, online marketing, um, but I like what it does for technical documentation <laughs> because you want to ask the right questions in advance to help you plan for need to know docs, right? So we don't need to document all the things. We just wanna document the important things, the things that we want our users to actually benefit from. Like how do I fix your problem? How do I help you, you know, do what you need to do with this software? Right, so you don't need to know everything. Your users don't need to know everything. So just like you don't want to write a piece of code that's not really gonna be useful, 
The same thing is with the documentation. And this is something that actually will help you because many times I hear from uh, developers or people who are not writers, especially, is saying, oh, I gotta write you know, documentation. It's just big, scary, monolithic books and whatever. No, a readme is documentation. An error message is documentation, right? So how do we figure it out? What do we, how do we compile this kind of need to know documentation plan? Right? The first one, the first question I'm going to ask is who is going to be reading this? Who are my users? Who are my readers? Uh, what do they want? You can divide it. As, we call this sometimes persona-based documentation. Um, so if you have, uh, if your users are more kind of a general public, then you want to create a specific type of documentation for them. I'm going to give a lot of examples in a bit. Um, most of our users are developers, for example, um, so they are going to want to know different things, right? So, or you can divide it up also by experience level. You know, if you have beginner-friendly documentation or a more expert, advanced uh, users. Uh, sometimes you also want to divide it by region because different cultures, different geographical regions might consume different information in different ways. Um, it'll, it'll also affect the language that you use. I mean, the default language for technical writing is simplified English or American English, and, uh, but some places, for example, will have a different dialect or even a different language. So I'm not actually gonna touch too much on translation. Um, that's, a whole, that's a different talk, <laughs> and it's not quite my field of expertise. Um, so what do they need to know, right? So this is where you start planning based on who, who you have reading your documentation, who's using your software, right? So what do they need to know? Do they wanna get started installing, configuring? Maybe they wanna, you wanna give them a tutorial. Maybe you wanna show them how everything is, fits together. So you wanna put together like some architecture documentation. I don't know. Um, and you also wanna kind of get started thinking how you're going to show this information. So for example, if you have an architecture document, then diagrams are your best friends. Um, I'm not quite familiar with a lot of open source uh, diagram tools. They do exist. Um, so, and the next question I want to ask is when do my readers, readers equals users, when do they need to know this information? Now this is very interesting for me personally. I, I love that because you don't want to overload your users with information to early or too much in advance, right? So if I'm a user, I'm you know, picking up this new tool and I'm just getting started. So what's the bare minimum? It's like you, know, you have minimum viable product uh, when you're talking about agile development. You have a minimum viable content, <laughs> I guess. Um, so like, what do I need to know when I start using the tool? What do I need to know when I'm already quite familiar with it, but I need to do something specific? And what do I need to know when I hit a wall and I've tried everything else? Um, so things like that. Um, and then where do you want to present this information to your users? Right? So for example, if you have a man page or error messages, something in the terminal, or if you have a uh, documentation library somewhere, uh, sometimes if you have a GUI, then you can have embedded text. Um, and you have to make sure that this content is reachable when the people need it, because you can have the best documentation ever, but if they can't find it, it doesn't exist, really. You know? And then that's not really useful for you or for them. Um, and then the last thing, which is usually the most important one, is after I've looked at all this, why do I even want the users to read this information? How is my content helping the users to solve their problems, you know, and showing users and readers how awesome your tool is, is not quite what I would consider a re an answer to that question. <laughs> you know, you're basically putting everything in the, the WIFM test, the what's in it for me, you know, like I'm, I'm showing you this piece of content, why do I care, you know, how does this actually help me? And this question sometimes helps you uncover possibly something else that you may not have wanted to look at. So for example, if I, if I find myself documenting a gigantic list of troubleshooting um, steps or a lot of uh, workarounds to a component, then maybe something is not quite right in the component itself, right? So instead of documenting a bunch of bugs, 
maybe we can try and fixing them. So this is, this is kind of uh, what I'm trying to kind of spark this uh, thought for you. So examples, I love screenshots, everybody loves screenshots. And if you can't really see the screenshots in the back of the room, I will also post my slides uh, so you'll be able to see them. And I also have links <coughs> to almost everything, uh, citations are important. So uh, the gnome, help.gnome.org is a website where you can uh, see the documentation for the gnome. Uh, for gnome uh, desktop has users, administrators, and developers. What does that mean? This is persona-based documentation. Okay. By the way, if I have Fedora or any, uh, or any kind of gnome on my desktop and I press the help button, I automatically go to the user's help because I'm in the desktop, I'm in the GUI, so this is probably what I want, right? But if you go online, then the first question that GNOME is asking you is, who are you, okay? And then the users will be able to get, this is quite similar to the screen that you'll see if you press help in GNOME. Um, so it's different things that you can do in the desktop as a user, as just a regular neighborhood friendly user. Um, and then if you go to the administrators tab, you basically just see, you know, different, just the content, co uh, so it's audience targeted. Right? And then if you're a developer, then you get only you know, the API references and the application development, only the content that you need, okay? Because you want to achieve a certain goal, right? So as, as, this is something that we talk about a lot when we plan user stories, for example. So as a, an administrator, I want to something buy something, right? So this is, a, this is kind of the, where the content comes into play. So the other example I have, which I love, is the Arch Linux wiki. Arch Linux users, we have, we have a few. Yeah, yeah, all right. That, that's, about, that's about the ratio, you know, about maybe five or six people out of this room, right? But they're very, very, uh, these are very advanced users. Um, and the wiki, I've always hear great compliments about it, really lovely things, why? Because even though it doesn't look, it doesn't look too sexy right now, but all I care about is this little box. Because people who are getting to the Arch Linux wiki, or most wiki users, have already tried everything. So I don't really need to prioritize browsability. What I want to do is I want to help the users get exactly what they want. And if I'm an Arch Linux user and I run into trouble, I'm going to want to say, like, how the hell do I do this, blah, blah, blah thing, whatever. So the search capability in this wiki is quite good. Um, so, the next thing I want to show is, uh, I used to work on a project called Minishift. It's a uh, um, local containerized OpenShift instance. It's a fork of Minikube from Kubernetes. Um, and this is all from GitHub. We upstream project that gets channeled downstream at Red Hat. And I wanted to show you this readme because it's short. Okay? And the readme is probably the most important piece of documentation that an open source project can have. Let that sink in. If your open source project is like your house, this is your entrance hall, okay? This is your foyer, okay? You don't want to clutter your foyer with all your stuff because if you have guests coming over or if you're interviewing potential housemates or I don't know what, you want to give them a portal to what they need. Now, I'm, I apologize, this is kind of small text, but it's literally a portal into your open source project. You have, you know, the welcome, you have the build status, because that's important. You know, you have how to get started. We have a link to the installation um, and to getting started documentation. And uh, then you have a link to the rest of the documentation, um, which I'm quite proud of. It's my baby. I hope they didn't ruin it. I didn't actually check it in the last couple of months because uh, I'm not on this project anymore. Uh, and then how to contribute because we want more contributors, right? Um, <coughs> so uh, invest as if you have to do one thing in your open source project, I would desperately ask you to you, make your readme nice and make your readme welcoming. You know, because that's the first thing that people see. If I go into, a, into GitHub and I look at the readme and it's just cluttered with stuff, I'm just not gonna have any patience for it. Um, so the last example from this I wanted to tell you is we had, uh, this is a use case, we needed to tell the users not to do something, but we couldn't actually block them from doing something. And so <laughs> we kind of needed to give them a warning that if you do this thing, um, then you can't actually do it. Uh, it's gonna you know, lock up your VM and whatever. I'm not going to go into too much details because of time, but if you want, you can look at it in the slides later. So I basically had to, I had a bunch of information about why this problem 
can cause trouble for the users, but we had to decide how much information to put in the terminal. So what we did was we basically said, you know, in this case, installing additional packages on the root file system in your um, VM container might exceed the allocated overlay size and lock the mini shift VM, okay? If you do this, cause effect. Proceed with the installation at your own risk. So like theoretically we can't stop you from doing it, but you probably don't want to do it. And for more information, we gave him a link to where the documentation has all of this information, this background, this context, right? So in case the user sees this and doesn't believe us that this is actually gonna happen, oh no, I wanna actually read everything that has to do with it. Then this is where we put it in the actual uh, documentation. Okay, so the next thing I wanna talk about is DevOps for Docs. We're gonna geek out a little bit about tooling. Um, it's mostly tooling that um, I would imagine that most open source uh, developers and makers uh, know. Uh, but uh, over the last years, there's been a great shift into uh, incorporating a lot of the tooling that the developers are using into the writing world. Um, and the key word is integration, um, because there's no point in trying to reinvent the wheel anymore. When I started working as a technical writer almost 10 years ago, we were using like word processor, like FrameMaker, and then we switched to XML, and then you know, you know, Markdown came along, and then ASCII doc, and, and an RST, and like there's so many different things that you can do. You don't, you know, and, and the whole the whole shift that I've been seeing, you know, is to get the writing tools as closely linked as possible with the development tools, because nobody wants to do double work. Like why would you know? There's just no point. Okay, so the first one is the unified tooling. Like I said, if it ain't Baroque, don't fix it. Um, I'm gonna use Minishift as the main example uh, because I was very, like, really lucky to help set up the documentation for this project from the ground floor. Yeah, I don't get to do this too often, this is great. Uh, and it's a small enough project that I was able to just kind of build this baby. Um, so in the root directory of the GitHub repository, we have a docs folder and inside you can drill down uh, into where, like, let's say here's the getting started, and in here we have about, uh, we have the main topic here, and then we have, you know, installing, quick start, a quick start as an example, um, driver plugins, uninstalling, and updating. Okay, this is probably the most information you want to have in a getting started section, and please feel free, I've been getting, I love getting questions about, like, how much information should I give about getting started and things like that, so come and talk to me later. Um, and another thing that we do here is we have issue tracking where we um, set up, that's another way to kind of unify the process as well. So if we tag something as a documentation issue or a pull request or whatever it is, then it helps, um, this is the list of issues as it was like, I don't know, six months or a year ago. Um, so we can have um, the different priorities and it's basically integrating the documentation tasks or bugs or whatever into the general issue tracking. And if you have a volunteer run, you know, contributor heavy, like if this is not your job, right, then, and you wanna take in new contributors, documentation issues are a great way to onboard new contributors to your project because there's less of a chance of breaking all the things if you contribute to documentation. So it's a little bit, um, it doesn't have so much of an anxiety uh, factor for people who are relatively new to open source technology and to programming. Um, okay, a continuous publication. We don't need to stop the press anymore. I remember when we used to print books. I don't think I've seen a printed guide in years. Um, we do still publish PDFs on the Red Hat customer portal, but I don't know who uses them. Um, so there are many tools, you know, it's the same thing as you have for your continuous uh, deployment. Um, you can integrate a lot of things, uh, ASCII Docker, you can put it either in, um, like we have things in the GitHub repo, you can put it in your Jenkins builds or whatever it is. I mean, I have a blog, it's written in Markdown, it's published with Jekyll and GitHub pages, it just goes. You know, I do an update, I merge a pull request and it's done. You know, so there's no reason why we can't do that for um, software development as well. And the continuous deployments, like you said, I'm giving you read the docs because read the docs is awesome and does all the builds and you should contribute to read the docs because they're good people and they're doing really good work. And things like live preview staging, net, net, Netlify, you know, they, all these different things that you can set up um, to be able to, for example, preview 
your online output of your documentation, um, just as a part of the, the pull request review process, you know? So uh, testing automation is still hard. It's definitely the hardest problem that we have in documentation because unlike code, documentation doesn't neatly compile into binaries. So there's, it's much harder to validate syntax uh, and grammar. And when you're talking about grammar, it's like actual English grammar, right? So I mean, it's, it's, it's still quite a problem, but there are uh, tools, for example, linguistic validation, the Hemingway app that everybody knows and possibly loves, I don't know. It's really, it's pretty nice. Um, we also have uh, test automation frameworks come, come up occasionally, um, and if anybody knows of a good uh, or an up and coming uh, documentation test automation framework. So this is something, it's called the Amender. Some tech writers at Red Hat are uh, doing this, it's on GitHub. Uh, and it's something that you can feed your style guide to. And it's like not just, you know, link checking and stuff like that, it's actual terminology. You know, if we have conventions, like, you know, you write mini shift with a capital M. Like, you know, we need things to validate things like that. Um, and so, unfortunately, testing is hard. <laughs> and if anybody has an idea or has something that they want to share, send it to me because I would love to know. I would like, I would like that part of the talk to actually be more useful. <laughs> but sometimes you just have to say, yeah, we haven't solved this yet. <laughs> um, so the last thing I want to talk about is the spirit of open source communities. And this is where I'm going to get really fluffy because I love it. I really do. And I, I think that most people that I've met um, are emotionally invested in open source technology, even if it is your job, you know, because, uh, you know, you, you can have tech jobs here, there, wherever, you know, but something about the community spirit that just makes it feel not just useful or, yeah, you get a salary or whatever, but you're also doing something uh, on a bit of an idealistic level, um, which is part of why people will... <laughs> sometimes burn themselves out from doing too much volunteer open source work because it really is so engaging, you know? So, um, <laughs> and I'm specifically, you know, particularly, I love the Python and Django communities because they are so inclusive. You know, I, start, I got introduced to it through Django Girls and then with Write the Docs, which is heavily linked in, in personality to the Python and Django communities. We take a lot of our things from that. And so let's help people, you know, let's be more, even more inclusive. Let's keep doing this because we're doing, you know, open source uh, communities are an amazing place and we should keep doing this. So, um, remember I said Docs didn't happen? This is, a, this is I'm gonna talk about uh, different community efforts and how to kind of get people more involved in documentation for your project. I hear so many times I hear, yeah, we got some developers contributing to it or whatever, but nobody really, either has time or has the motivation or has the skill because it is, it is, there is a skill factor uh, involved in writing some documentation. I mean, the, the bare minimum is something that I've seen most developers able to do. I mean, obviously if you want to do some kind of monolithic documentation library, you probably want a writer. Um, and if you're the sum of your components, if it's bigger, if the whole is bigger than the sum of its parts, then you probably want some kind of overarching documentation person to look at it. Um, but if you're just you know, trying to get contributors, this is another thing that you can do. So you can make uh, documentation a requirement. And it doesn't have to be spectacular. It can have typos. You know, not everybody's a native English speaker. You know, not everybody is a, 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 a content writer. But at least give it a shot you know, like these are some projects that in their um, patch guidelines or in their uh, 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 request guidelines, so they re require that you um, add documentation to it. Um, so this is, this is the first step, okay, is, is to encourage people to do it and to ask them to do it and make them do it. <laughs> you know, because sometimes if you don't make people do it, then they won't. And even, but, but you can be gentle about it a little bit. Um, and this is one way that you can help is by writing specific contribution guidelines for documentation because of the difference in prose and code um, then in the same way that you write contribution guidelines to your code, you can write contribution guidelines to your docs. Um, you can give them templates, templates. I love templates, templates are great. This is the 
um, readme template from the beginner's guide to documentation on the Write to Docs website. I think to date, this, is, this page on our website has gotten the most hits. Um, and I've heard so many people say, oh yeah, read the docs, write the docs, I use this template. So templates are awesome, and there are many of them, um, and you should use them. And also, obviously, uh, you can geek out about tooling and give people templates, um, but just like you are all here in this conference um, talking to other humans about technology and getting excited about it, we also have a documentarian community that's growing. So it's not just me running around in developer events going, please do documentation. <laughs> so we actually have, um, there are two communities uh, that I'm uh, involved with or, um, or support, and one of them is obviously Write the Docs. Uh, we have two conferences, one in Portland, Oregon in May, and one in Prague in September. We're opening the CFP next week, <laughs> and um, uh, we'll be happy to see you there. Um, and uh, there's also Open Help Conference, which we're actually uh, in the process of collaborating with, so expect some interesting news. Open Help is mostly, it's organized by a good buddy of mine, Sean McCants, in Cincinnati, Ohio, and it's mostly sprints, mostly focusing on open source project documentation. Um, so there are, there are people out there who are, you know, doing, doing you know, the, the documentation community is definitely growing. Um, and what I love about these events is that I think in Write the Docs specifically, I don't have so many stats on open help, but in Write the Docs we have about 40% of our attendees are not writers, 40 or 50% are not writers. So we have developers, we have designers, all the people from the, the circle diagram that I showed you in the beginning, we get all of them. We have librarians, we have scientists, and everybody wants to talk about content communication. Um, so it's very much a cross-discipline, cross-platform, and you know, it's so amazing. We have an unconference and I see people from Microsoft and Facebook and Google and Red Hat all sitting in the same table talking about something and not fighting. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> um, the other thing, as, you, as I've said before, uh, we can also do documentation sprints, hackfests, workshops, uh, some examples of stuff that I did. Um, and I will run a help desk on Sunday. I think it's already on the schedule in the hallway track. Richard was giving it a shout out as well. So I will be here throughout the weekend, but on Sunday specifically, I'm gonna run a documentation clinic or help desk. So any questions you have, you know, I have this broken read me, what do I do? How should I plan this? Like, come and talk to me because I love to help. Okay, and you know, this is basically free consulting, so use it, okay? <laughs> um, and, um, and I have stickers, because stickers are important. <laughs> um, yeah, so welcome to the Documentarian Club. Thank you so much again for having me. Come and talk to me about Docs or It Didn't Happen, and thank you. <laughs>